the power of AI is in the edges, the people using it for their job. You need to figure a way to incentivize them and capture that. You need to give them access to frontier models. And I know that's hard because that's not how IT departments work. But the damage is going to happen one way or another. Everyone's already using AI everywhere in your organization. They're just not telling you about it. Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Ethan Malik. Ethan is an associate professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, where he studies and teaches innovation and entrepreneurship and examines the effects of artificial intelligence on work and education. In addition to his research and teaching, Ethan also leads Wharton Interactive, an effort to democratize education using games, simulations, and AI. Prior to his time in academia, Ethan co-founded a startup company and is an advisor to entrepreneurs and other executives as well. Ethan's latest book is Co-Intelligence, Living and Working with AI, a book that I've had a chance to read recently and recommend. I first got to know his work through his blog, which can be found at oneusefulthing.org, which has nearly 120,000 followers. Ethan, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. It's great to be here. Um, thanks for having me. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure. Well, let's begin. I, I would love, from a context-setting perspective, you teach entrepreneurship, and you are a former entrepreneur. I wonder if you could take a moment and talk a bit about your entrepreneurial journey uh, and your journey back into academia following that. Uh, sure. So I uh, became an entrepreneur during the first internet boom in the late 90s, early 2000s. I had a brilliant college roommate of mine who was a technological genius and knew an industry really well. And he got me to join him in a startup and we we created the world's first paywall. So I feel bad about that still. I, I feel like that's what I'm trying to earn off by being in academia. So sorry, we created the paywall. Um, but um, you know, went and I was the sales, marketing, outward facing person trying to convince 500 year old companies that it literally had the original Gutenberg press to that they should go online and sell their stuff. Um, and it was pretty successful, but we made every mistake possible, right? So every hiring mistake you could imagine, every management mistake you could imagine, equity, all kinds of things. Like we were successful to play it ourselves. So I thought I got to figure out how to do this right. Decided to go get an MBA at MIT. Realized nobody actually knew much about how to make entrepreneurship successful, and then decided to get a PhD and study this stuff. So that's sort of where I am, and um, you know why I was interested. And some, as somebody who uh, has been an entrepreneur but also helps entrepreneurs, I wonder: are there innate qualities that are important for successful entrepreneurs? In from your perspective, you teach it, so this is the you know you you take care of the you know teaching them the, the aspects that are not already in them, perhaps. But are, are there certain you know attributes that you tend to find among people who are successful entrepreneurs? So one of the things I think that's most important about doing a study of entrepreneurship is almost everyone's instincts aren't that helpful in entrepreneurship. Like a lot of people's gut feel, people tell stories about entrepreneurship that, do, that aren't matched by the data. We actually know a lot of things now about founders and what makes them successful. And so, for example, entrepreneurial personality, deeply studied. It turns out that there are personality traits that predict you wanting to be an entrepreneur but there are no personality traits that predict entrepreneurial success durably, right? Outside of things that generally make you successful in life, being, uh, you know, less neurotic, more, you know, conscientious, those things are very helpful. But, you know, the number one personality trait for predicting entry into entrepreneurship is overconfidence. So, and so you end up getting a lot of people who look like they're going to see, but they're just the people trying more. But all of those factors don't actually predict things. So one thing that actually worries me a lot is when people say, oh, you don't got the entrepreneurial type. That's just not backed up by the data. Similarly, like age is, you know, people assume you have to be a young person's game. The average age for a founder in the United States is 42. The average age for a founder who raises venture capital is 42. The average age for a founder who achieves hyper growth is between you know, uh, 45 and 59. Like, so a lot of people's mental image of what an entrepreneur is aren't matched by reality. Well, one statistic that I believe is uh, uh, broadly known and thought about is the concentration of them in, in places like Silicon Valley in the U.S. More generally speaking, you and I were uh, talking recently about how Penn itself, where you where you teach, I guess it was two two years ago, uh, uh, Penn alums received more venture capital than the combination of France and Germany combined. Um, pretty remarkable. Uh, so what is it about the U.S. that, uh, what are some of the secret ingredients of this this country that have made uh, entrepreneurship so so prominent? So it's a hotly debated issue. And, and the answer seems to be a mix of, um, of um, you know, there's always some kind of luck in continuing on direction. Universities, um, I mean, if you look, the brew that sort of caused Silicon Valley, right? Universities, immigration of, of highly talented people. Right. And then free market kind of capital that is pretty fairly meritocratic. 
um, and a um, and sort of a, a medium level of regulation seems to help. But also tax incentives turn out to matter a lot in these kind of circumstances. Uh, you know, the way interest is treated and returns on investment are treated. So there's lots of little things, but it's it's tended to be a you know very good education system and you know university system. Um, uh, high incentives from uh, you know and returns from entrepreneurship and high skilled immigration. Yeah, very interesting. And, and I asked you the question earlier in the in the balance between nature and nurture, the nature aspects of this from a nurture perspective, at least in the context of a class like yours. What are some of the? I, forgive me. This is a, I'm sure you could take the the entire hour that we have to talk about this. But what are some of the top items that that need to be taught uh, or are most useful to learn in a setting like yours for for those who aspire to to start companies? So if we just start from where the data supports things, there's three or four sort of key things that are definitely teachable. So one key thing that's teachable that makes a big difference is teaching people to do disciplined experimentation in entrepreneurship. So that is hypothesis, you know, you hypothesize something relevant about your business and you do testing and you either pivot or continue. That turns out to be really important. And people who disciplined hypothesis based testing have higher revenues by a, like exponentially higher than people who don't engage in that process. The second major thing is there it turns out there's a lot of stuff that you that actually makes a difference around um, you know, how you pitch, how you explain, how you raise financing. There's a complication there. A lot of people view like raising VC as a prize, and it's not. It's a method of getting somewhere with advantages and disadvantages. So that's another set of stuff. The third is management matters. So being hiring is hugely important, and a lot of people don't know how to hire or how to make hiring work. Building an organizational structure just so you could scale past 20 people where your individual level of like energy is no longer enough to kind of cover an entire organization. That turns out to be very important. And there's a whole bunch of stuff around uh, mentoring, networking, that all seem to be a big difference in teaching people skills and that helps a lot. And, and forgive me, I should have asked this question perhaps a little bit earlier, but how do you define an entrepreneur? It, um, is it as broad as anyone who starts an enterprise? Is a, is a you know a baker who starts uh, his or her own bakery an entrepreneur in your mind? Are there further qualifications? Uh, how do you define it? So it's one of the, you know, you're asking an academic an academic question. So we love that. But um, <laughs> the, and the academics answer to every question like that is it depends, right? So um, I focus in my classes and my book and uh, the previous book, not this AI book, on uh, high growth entrepreneurship. So that is people who are looking to start a business or an organization and grow and scale rapidly. But yes, there's small business owners as entrepreneurship. The entrepreneurship inside companies is sometimes defined as part of entrepreneurship. Um, launching a nonprofit that you know with intent to scale and grow is entrepreneurship. So it's a very flexible term. Yeah. And how many people who take your class end up starting companies? I have not tracked the exact number, but um, and the interesting thing is it's not the first class that does it, right? So we actually do track entrepreneurship rates overall. When people graduate from Wharton, maybe one to two percent of people upon graduation launch companies. But by the time you're three or four jobs in, twenty to thirty percent have launched a company. So a lot of it, going back to that age thing, a lot of this is it's hard to launch a company. Like you can launch a consumer company aimed at college kids when you're in college, but you're not going to really understand the enterprise needs of a Fortune 500 company. But working at an enterprise at a Fortune 500 company for a couple of years, like there's 50 things I know this company needs and I keep telling them they need it and they won't do it. So I'm just going to leave. And I, by the way, I know the best people in my company, so I'm going to take them with me. And I actually have some resources now so I can raise funding. And that's a much more common form of entrepreneurship. I, I also want to ask you, the, I'm sure you have many of your students approach you during your office hours or after class and ask you some version of what would you recommend I go do? Uh, and, and given the fact that you're a professor of entrepreneurship, I imagine at least in some cases it's go start something. But, but uh, I wonder across your, your tenure uh, as a professor, how that's evolved. And certainly I would imagine artificial intelligence, we'll get into a lot more specifics as this conversation goes on must further qualify your response as well. But, you know, how is how has uh, your advice changed across your time as a, as a professor of entrepreneurship? Well, I mean, I think there's a, divide, a bright dividing line in in about AI that changes everything in very large ways. So I don't think past advice versus current advice is a useful comparison because I don't think the world's the same shape as it was now uh, before. So, um, you know, my advice has always been you um, you can wait to be an entrepreneur. There's nothing wrong with that. People have student loans. They have things, they, have, they haven't found the perfect idea. They don't need to force it. There's not a limited window of opportunity, which I guess is back to the age thing, right? 
Um, at the same time, you need to, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you need to be open to opportunity. There's no angel of entrepreneurship that will descend and say, my child, now it is time, launch a company. So you have to be aware and open for opportunity. You have to be making sure you don't get golden handcuffs. A lot of Penn students go work in finance, and it's very easy to have a lifestyle that makes it so it's very hard to launch a startup company. So you have to be do watchful waiting, preparing. Um, and that's, that's a very different um, mindset than a lot of people have. I was fascinated in, in preparation and just referring to some of your your past writings uh, that you've noted that one of the things that has changed is AI in some ways can serve as a co-founder of a business. Um, and I wonder if you could explain that. There's been a lot, at least historically written about the importance of co-founders and having like the example you had that you had, you were the salesperson to somebody who was much more technical than you were as you launched a firm uh, soon after undergrad. Um, talk a little bit about your your vision of, of at least in some cases, uh, AI being the co-founder of a business. First of all, let's just talk about co-founders for a moment because I have some research on this. Great. Another cult-like thing is there needs to be co-founders. And uh, Y Combinator famously for a long time wouldn't allow you to join the company if uh, if you didn't have a co-founder. And so there's a famous story about Dropbox, uh, the founder getting into Y Combinator, and this turns out to be true, uh, and being told upon joining, like, no, no, you need a co-founder you need to have one by this afternoon. And he went to the MIT cafeteria and just found someone random and said, why don't you co-found Dropbox with me? And that's how he found his co-founder. Um, that is not a great way to go. So there's a sort of belief that co-founders really matter. I have some studies with uh, my colleague, Jason Greenberg, and we find that actually single founders outperform co-founders in many cases because you don't have all the arguments. Like a large part of the reason why ventures fall apart is co-founder conflict. And you don't have that argument if you don't have a co-founder. The danger is you don't have someone else to bounce ideas off of and do work. But turns out what you could do as a founder is hire someone and give them a large equity stake. And they're a founding team member, but they're not the founder of the company, right? So they might still have a 15% equity and they're the CTO of the company, but they don't have to be the founder of the company as well. So that's an important part. And I think it's incredibly important in uh, when thinking about AI because AI can fill a lot of the functions you wanted a co-founder to do. So if you if you're a technical co-founder, it does really writes really good sales emails. It does projections. It actually gives you pretty good advice. There's an amazing study um, by some uh, some great researchers out of Kenya where they found if you were a top entrepreneur in Kenya, small business owner, and you got advice from GPT four, you had twenty percent higher profits afterwards than people who didn't get advice from GPT four. Like so, it definitely fills a role there. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Uh, you've referred to yourself as historically AI adjacent uh, and uh, also as the business school representative at the AI table. Uh, now that AI allows non-technical people to become much more technically savvy, or at least AI takes over some of the, fills some of the gaps of uh, those of us who are less technically savvy, uh, does it level the playing field more generally speaking between someone like yourself and maybe you're no longer a great example of this as you've gone from AI adjacent to somebody who's who can now write books about it? Uh, but relative to those people who are deeply technical, AI focused as opposed to AI adjacent. I think that in some ways it's a mistake to even lump AI in with technical things, right? Um, because the fact is large language models are they're very technical products. They're using them doesn't require technical knowledge. And in fact, I would argue that technical people are often the worst prompters of AI. So um, I think part of this is it's a technological advancement, but it's sort of like saying Excel is a technological advancement. Are you, you know, does Excel change how technical you are? Sort of, but also, you know, because you're not writing your own spreadsheets anymore, but also who thinks of it that way? So I think that it, it's a democratizing force in a lot of ways. I also noted that you've, you said that your syllabus has changed as a result of AI to ask students to do the impossible. Uh, I wonder if you could explain that. So I literally give people the assignment, like if you... Uh, like in my class, you have to do something impossible. So if you can't code, I need working software. If you never did design work, I need a working website. Um, so I need you to be like actually fully operational in, um, you know, with with AI. Um, so people who used to do assignment where you do a prototype and now I want like that to work. Um, and you don't have to be technical to do it. So that, uh, by the way, you also have to get critiques from three famous founders through history of each of your assignments you turn in because the number one predictor of entrepreneurial entry is overconfidence. So if I have a, you know, one way to to banish that is to have someone whispering in your ear, you know, you're mortal. And that's a useful thing to have the AI do. So uh, it really has changed how I work, how we do this work. Fascinating. I I, I want to get into some of the details from the book, Co-Intelligence. Um, you talk about four rules for co-intelligence, and I wanted to cover each of the four with you. Uh, the first of those is always invite artificial intelligence to the table. What do you mean by that? AI has what we call a jagged frontier. 
that means it's good at some tasks and bad at others. So you can get a, um, so if you ask the AI to give you a 25 word summary of a page, you might get 22 words or 28 words or some other number because the AI doesn't see words the way we do. It sees tokens, which are words or parts of words. So like a space is part of a token. Um, and so the AI will might miscount the words. If you ask it to write a sonnet summarizing the work, it'll do a great sonnet for you. How do we deal with a system where they can write an amazing sonnet, but can't do 25 words? Um, and so the idea is that if you use AI enough, you understand what's good or bad at, and that lets you navigate this frontier. It also lets you know what it, what difference it makes. Nobody knows how well AI will be applied to, you know, to the author of world-class IT strategy. Like nobody knows that, right? And you can figure that out, right? What does it know that you don't know? What do you know that it doesn't? The only way to do it is to take it to the podcast that you come to and see how it does summarizing our conversation and to also have it do prep work for the podcast and compare it to your prep work that you would do and then help it you write your next you know, post or piece of information and then help with an next consulting venture, your next speech. That's how you figure out what this is good or bad for. And that leads nicely then to the next uh, next of your rules for co-intelligence, be the human in the loop. Um, I think it flows nicely from what you've described, but, but do go into some detail as to how best to be the human in the loop. So this idea for control systems that you want a person involved in working with AI. Um, and it's a problem because AI is pretty solid. Like in our studies at Boston Consulting Group, we found it operating at like the eighth percentile of BCG consultants in a lot of ways, not in every dimension, but in many dimensions. That's tough. These are elite consultants, right? From you know, they come from a place like Wharton. We were highly trained, um, and so you need to think about as a person, what do you want to do? And right now, the good news is the AI is at the eighth percentile of high performance, but not the hundredth. And whatever you're probably best at in the world, you're probably in the top one percent, five percent, ten percent, and that's what you like to do. And the AI is not going to be better than you at that, at least not right now. So um, what that gives you is this opportunity to do focus on what you do well and give away the stuff you don't want to do. So being the human in the loop is also about how do you make AI part of your decision making, but how do you focus on what you do best? And you talked about how, uh, as you as you noted, if you're an expert in a field, you're likely better than than AI is today. And so it is, in, in many ways, uh, uh, best suited towards taking over those things that you don't enjoy and don't do best, perhaps. Um, how do you see this continuing to advance such that it goes from 8 to, to 99th um, and more fully replicating the sorts of things that we do? So, I mean, that's the question and the, kind of the only question that matters. I don't have answers. I talk to the people who are training these systems. They don't have answers, right? There's dividing lines between whether we keep on an exponential improvement curve until we reach artificial general intelligence, a machine smarter than a human being, or whether we don't succeed at that and, you know, it evens off in the near future. And a lot depends on that. And I don't have an easy answer, but I think people should be prepared for more upside case than they are right now. Yeah. Uh, the next rule for co-intelligence is treat artificial intelligence like a person, but tell it what kind of a person it is. Explain that if you would. You make AI do things by prompting it, essentially by giving it a sentence and then it auto-completes everything else afterwards, right? Um, and people make this very hard. There's there's all kinds of tricks of prompting. I'm a very good prompter. Like you do all kinds of weird stuff. But the easiest way to work with AI is just to talk to it like it's a human being, treat it like a person. And even though it's not a person, um, that's why managers are often so good at working with AI. Give it instructions the way you would a person, correct it the way you would a person, but then also tell it what kind of person it is. You're a manager at a, you know, you are a, a marketing manager at an IT company. You are a editor who has a, you know, preference for clear writing and you'll get better results that way. Your the the fourth of the four rules for co-intelligence is assume this is the worst AI you'll ever use. Uh, again, uh, describe that. Everything you're using right now is obsolete. There's better things being trained. So one of the fast things about AI is all these models are being released, and they're all sort of chatbots. They're all the interfaces are all slightly broken. They're not optimized for any particular job one way or another. And people kind of are they think that the story might be oh maybe we need to launch a startup that makes this better for our business or something like that. The reason why that's happening is every AI lab is spending all their time building the next generation of AI. And as soon as that evens off, they'll go back and figure out how to commercialize it more. But they're all building new stuff. So whatever you think the capability limits of AI are today, that's not going to be the limits in the near future. So everything you're using today is obsolete. Makes sense. And how do you, especially in light of that, how do you remain uh, abreast or how do you advise others to remain abreast of the many tools that one could use? I mean, the, the proliferation of them is such that you can have you know, dozens and dozens of options to choose from. Do you personally focus on a handful of them? And how do you add to that? Uh, what, what are the criteria by which you, you uh, determine to add to the, the list as it continues to grow? 
So my general advice to people is, is I differentiate between tools. There's lots of tools out there, especially sort of image creation, but lots of people creating tools. And then foundation models, which most of the tools are built on. Foundation models are large language models. There's a bunch of them out there. Anything from Llama 2 to Grok to ChatGPT, GPT 3.5, GPT 4. I would draw the line between those, especially if you're an entrepreneur or you're, a, you know, you're an executive and, a, um, and what are called frontier models. So the frontier models are the largest models. And right now, there's a very strong relationship, which is the scaling law. The larger your model is, the smarter your model is. And the effects are quite large. So Bloomberg spent $10 million plus training Bloomberg GPT, which was a specialized large language model that was supposed to do financial proje projections. They threw all the Bloomberg data in there. They trained it up. GPT-4 out of the box, the same model that you have access to for free in Bing and everyone in Mozambique and Sri Lanka has access to for free beats Bloomberg GPT and stock predictions, right? GPT-4 beats the best specialized models we have on um, medical advice and it beats doctors in, in terms of giving advice and patients prefer it because it's more empathetic than doctor answers, right? So the larger models do more things. And so when I talk about the tools, you should pick one of the three frontier models right now and spend 10 hours with it. And that's my number one piece of advice. Then later on, you can decide if you want to buy, you can do something specialized, it does something cool, great. But like, don't worry about the proliferation of tools. All that matters is the frontier models in the short term. They're all kind of similar. Think of this, they're all first year PhD students with different personalities. So there's three of them right now, arguably, maybe four that are frontier models. So as of the time we're talking, that is GPT-4, which you either get access to through ChatGPT Plus or through Microsoft's Bing Copilot Office kind of suite. There is uh, Google's um, Gemini Advanced or, or the Gemini Pro 1.5. Advanced, you can pay 20 bucks a month for. What Pro 1.5 is coming out soon and is you can get a preview access to. And then there is Claude 3, which just came out this week, um, which is all from Anthropic. All three of those are frontier models. There's arguably a fourth called Inflections uh, Pi 2.5, but that is a model optimized for chat. And it's very friendly and it's very compelling to speak to, but it doesn't necessarily do work for you. And, and may I ask, what, how have you divided your time across the, uh, the models you've mentioned? So I know GPT-4 are the best. So I use that for most of my work, but I also know the personalities. So I know Claude 3 is an excellent writer and I will often delegate writing tasks to, to it. Um, and uh, Gemini is very good at co compiling information in web search and very good at creating plans. So I'll use it for that. And, and speaking of writing, uh, how did you leverage it as part of Co-Intelligence, your book? There's almost no AI writing in the book that's not AI writing. And you'll, you know, having read it, that I, I have the, the AI appears as kind of a character in the book um, at times. Um, but I used it extensively in writing the book because I approached it from an integrated work we call, I call it a cyborg perspective. So, for example, I've written books before. You've written books. And, you know, one of the most annoying things is, like, you get stuck on a sentence. And then it just kind of kills your productivity for an hour. You end up walking away. You're like, I can't do it. Give me 20 versions of the sentence of different styles. Ask the AI. And that unlocks something. Uh, give me five analogies to explain this concept. Uh, read all these academic papers and summarize them for me to make sure my summaries are correct. Read this in the style of a, uh, you know, a 44-year-old dentist from Wisconsin and tell me what confuses you. Uh, and I use the AI in all of those different ways. In the book, you also write about uh, artificial intelligence as a person, a creative, coworker, tutor, coach, and our future. These are also uh, aligned with different sections of the book itself. Uh, I'd love to, we've talked to, in some ways about several of those already, but um, as you think about AI as a coworker, we talked a little bit about AI as a co-founder, and perhaps there are some similarities uh, in your mind between those, but how do you think of uh, artificial in intelligence as a coworker? Because the AIs work best like people, and not like machines, they slot very well into human systems. So you want help, re if you show it a document, it'll think about the document the way you think about the document roughly. And so it works very well as an individual worker to use AI to get things done because I can experiment with it. I can throw, you know, like I can throw stuff at it and see how well it does it. And if it doesn't do well, I won't delegate to it anymore. So everybody basically got a, uh, you know, an infinite number of first year PhD interns. Yeah, I, I love that analogy uh, in terms of the interns as well, or the PhD student that you talked about before. Um, how do you use AI as a tutor, or how would you suggest that others do so? That is both one of the most promising issue areas, and also what I give advice to at an individual level is different than what I give advice to at a policy level. So tutoring is the is the magical thing 
um, that is kind of one of the most exciting things about AI because there's a famous paper called Bloom's Two Sigma paper that's probably mostly, um, I don't know if the math still works, but the idea has been pro proven before, which is that one-on-one -on -one tutoring improves performance by up to two standard deviations. So you have the 50th percentile, 98th percentile performance after receiving tutoring, right? Um, and tutoring is very expensive. It's very hard to do. And so the AI is showing real promise working as a one-on-one -on -one tutor. We're not there yet. Now, the, that's different from how you'd use things individually. Like in a classroom, I want a tutor because tutors teach you things. And they teach you things by not telling you the answer. If you Google something, you won't remember it as well. There's actually a bunch of studies on this. But and so if the AI explains something to you, you won't necessarily get it better. But we have gotten the AI working as a tutor where it does what actually a tutor should do, which is ask you questions. So, you know, tell me how you think AI fits into the world of, you know, education. That's really good. But maybe you want to think more about how uh, the downside risk. Can you tell me what those might be? Great. How would you apply that to what we learned before? A tutor is soliciting information, correcting. And, like, and that's what makes the AI so interesting is it can do that interactive stuff. Now, personally, if you want to learn, the AI is very good at explaining things in, in your context. So you just say, you know, my name is X and I've worked in this industry and stuff before. And could you explain this part of quantum mechanics to me in a way I'd understand? And it does a very good job with that. Yeah, very interesting. And how, how, how would your advice differ for somebody who's, let's say, in elementary school versus high school versus college versus grad school? Do you see, I mean, naturally, of course, there, there's the sophistication of what would be entered in uh, to get tutoring from. Uh, and the the level of advancements that that the individual would have in those different settings. Do you see it first of all as something that's additive in each of those settings that would encourage parents to encourage uh, their their children, especially uh, to get involved with? But can you talk a bit about how you see some of those differences as somebody who studies the intersection of of uh, these topics with education more generally speaking? Well, we don't have good tools right now, right? So like the best tool out there in tutoring is uh, Khan Academy's Comigo. Mm -hmm. um, which, while flawed, is still the best approach out there right now to doing tutoring with AI. And like, anyone can subscribe for 20 bucks a month or something. I think it's 10 bucks a month. Like, that's the tool. Like, I subscribe my kids to that, right? Um, as a parent, by the way, it works really well. If you try to remember how an algebra problem works, you can have it explain. I mean, like, no, actually, like, explain this to me. Remind me why it works this way. So it can get you back up to speed very well. But it really is about interacting with the AI again, using it as a tutor and asking questions. It makes mistakes. There's errors in it. The real issue is like, what do you not want to use it for? Like, what do you need to learn? And that's a bigger question. And, and uh, as you think about a tutor or an educator, how does that differ from another one of the areas that you focus on in the book, which is um, uh, AI as a coach? How do you suggest that as a potential use? Advisors are helpful. And so there's a lot of stuff we teach you in an MBA program that basically is sort of self-coaching. So for example, let's take pre-mortems. So you increase the chance of project success by about 18 to 22% by having uh, a, doing a pre-mortem, which means sitting down and saying, how could our project fail, right? And you, don't, that, you never guess the real reason why it fails. You're not actually doing a, a real cause analysis, but it gives the people on your team permission to talk about failure, which we don't usually have. And that lets you think about downside risk. And that's why it increases success, right? It doesn't proof you against it, but it lets you have a conversation about what could go wrong. We teach people how to do that. There's some delicate things you have to do to make a pre-mortem work well. I can give you a paragraph and you can paste that in GPT-4 or BARD or whatever else you like, or Gemini or whatever else you like, and you'll get a pretty good interactive coach that will take you through the process of doing a pre-mortem. Uh, you know, it can read all of your transcripts from our conversations happening right now. And I could say, where, you know, where was I funny? Like, did I have any jokes miss? What should I have said differently? Um, was there a moment that was awkward? How do I deal with that? Help me improve myself. Yeah, it very uh, it, all interesting uses, and as you as you point out, uh, all of us need coaches to to some extent. So the extent to which this is something that's uh, a, a, an easy uh, version of that for us to access, so much the better. One that's only getting better as time goes on. Uh, I wanted to also ask you about as, again as a professor, how you see all of this changing the classroom setting. There was a lot of promise and a lot of. Um, a lot written and pontificated about as to how the MOOCs would change learning. And in, in the grand scheme of things, it didn't seem to, at least so dramatically, forgive me, as you've been in a, in a university setting more recently than I have, but at least that's my sense, that there's still a lot of classes that are taught as they were taught 250 years ago today. Uh, and, and I wonder what will be different this time around uh, in terms of the, the, the changes that will be made specifically in the classroom and in the group setting itself. So this is a really good question. So for those who don't know, MOOCs are, you know, large online classes. Uh, it's, uh, it's massive online uh, courses, right? 
Coursera, um, and, Udacity, LinkedIn exactly. Learning. And I, I've got I've got a Coursera courses that have had a quarter million people take it. Like I've I've done this thing. And so I've seen this from the inside. In fact, part of the reason why I launched Wharton Interactive, which is an interactive simulation experience, is after recording some MOOCs, I'm like, oh, we need something very different than this. Because MOOCs did something very important, which was expand the who can get access to education, right? I've had a quarter million people take my entrepreneurship courses. Wonderful. Like, you know, they're not pay like they can pay or not pay. I mean, I don't it's not an issue to me. They can watch these videos for free. And they have a chance to, you know, that like to get an experience. And for some set of learners, that is transformative. If you're, you know, you're, you could be anywhere in the world now and get a decent experience of a college lecture, like, you know, not interactive, but like, a, you know, and that's valuable. And there's been millions of people who I think have had their lives improved by that. But it's a very static thing, right? It's like buying a book or watching a videotape. The MOOCs are not dynamic. They're not built around the pedagogy of how we learn at best. And so they did do something amazing, which was expand and democratize access, but they haven't changed the life of my students because lectures have always been one of the worst ways to teach, right? The way to teach is we know how to teach properly, which is active learning. You do stuff in the classroom. Now there's a bunch of problems with active learning. One of the problems with active learning is that it's really hard to do because you have to keep your students engaged in doing learning. The second is people hate active learning, like students do. There was a great study at Harvard where um, they took the intro physics class and half the class got lectures and the other half had to do active learning, problem sets and other stuff in class. The people who did active learning reported learning less, but they did much, much better on tests. Why they learn less? Because as opposed to being in a lecture where I can talk and you can, like on this podcast, you can sit back and be like, yeah, yeah, I got this, right? You don't have to do anything. It's like there are tutoring argument. I, the tutor forces you to realize what you don't know. Active learning forces you to know what you don't know. No one likes feeling ignorant. And so they hate the active learning experience, right? Um, but that's the valuable way to teach. We also have had trouble implementing active learning because that means we have to teach outside the classroom. And that means watching like a MOOC video, which are not great ways to teach. AI unlocks both those possibilities because it lets us do these flipped classrooms because I can have an AI tutor outside of class do the content teaching and then it can help me create good engaging experiences inside of class so we're doing active learning when we're all together and doing the passive learning outside of class. So I think that's a real chance for transformation. And are you seeing some of these changes already, especially in a, a, a class that's as progressive on these topics as your, yours is? Oh, my classes are 100% AI required now. Mm -hmm. um, so it's absolutely, it's working out amazingly. And when, and when, what do you, I mean, you've, you've explained some of your vision, which presumably uh, has been pulled forward given that, given your focus in this area. I, 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 one thing that I, I've heard you say is that people raise their hands less um, and the, the way in which they're interacting with you naturally and interact with each other changes as a result of this. Can you get a little bit further into some of the details or your, of your observations uh, having implemented this in, in the classroom and in your classroom? Uh, yeah. So let's talk about, you know, the, the, the downside risk is already happening, right? Everyone who wants to cheat can cheat. And it, there's no easy way to detect AI writing. It's not a great situation, right? The second thing is that, um, you know, people are interacting in a different way. Like, you know, there are already issues where people on social media in class and have their phones out, whatever else. But now, like, you can get caught up by the AI helping you catch up. Uh, so that changes, and that changes the social construct in class. Normally, you pay attention. You don't know something, you raise your hand. And then I know that if you don't know that, probably half the class doesn't know it, and we can have a conversation, right? And it's a... People can extract knowledge from me and I can you know, figure out what people need to know. That social contract breaks with AI. On the other hand, it enables new kinds of teaching. So we already talked about doing an impossible thing. Another example, I have the students uh, co-create cases with the AI where they have to kind of correct the AI's direction. I have them build, I had my uh, MBAs do an assignment where they had to replace themselves. So they had to, uh, for a job that they were applying for, they had to automate part of that job so they could just go into the first interview, say, here's my job is done with this AI. Um, I need a raise. And, um, you know, they did it. Like everyone from Navy pilots to private equity funds to hip hop designers had figured out ways to make this work. It was very cool to watch that all happen. And, um, and you know, a few of them got jobs right afterwards as a result, by the way. So, like, it changes what you can do in classrooms. And we've, we've been mapping out um, all kinds of ways you could do that. And you, you talked about how, uh, you know, people have – I heard you speak about someone in your class who clearly was not paying attention. You were, you were lecturing, and they were building a business model in the class itself. And by the next day, they were getting funding for it. And you're seeing more of these sorts of things happen as well as a, as a result of some of these changes. 
Yeah, but when the, I first the, introduced the, ChatGPT to my students, literally one person built a working app by the end of the class and had uh, VC scouts reach out to them the next day, right? <laughs> so that was like what other, like, so this, this really enables all kinds of new changes for people. It's very exciting. That's really interesting. I want to return to a point you made uh, just a couple of minutes ago that anyone can cheat. Clearly in a, in a setting like yours, uh, this is something that it must be contemplated tremendously across a university as it is, of course, across high schools and all schools. And maybe even more so in, in, in I don't know, English classes or history classes where um, there's that much more with the written word, perhaps, um, although correct me if I'm wrong. But but anyway, I, I, what, what is your perspective on this? I, I know there's been consternation with uh, each advance in technology. I mean, the, the calculator, even as it was introduced, was uh, thought of as a, a method of cheating. And I know, know there was at least some thought put to as whether or not this was an appropriate tool to have in classes. This, of course, is much more sophisticated, as this conversation certainly reflects. Um, now that anyone can cheat, what's the what sorts of governors, if any, would do you advise for academics to put on it? Or is it simply, look, live with it and let's think about new norms as associated with this as a result? I mean, so calculators absolutely disrupted math in the mm -hmm. 1970s, right? And it took a while to figure things out. And what we decided to do was you still need to learn how to do math by hand, but then by sixth or seventh grade, you could switch over to the calculator and do more advanced math. So you still have to do tests where you do math by hand without a calculator. We've solved the problem. And so you're going to see a mix of classes that way. I would expect a lot of English composition classes to switch to in class, you're going to be writing essays and maybe getting feedback from a mix of AIs and humans. And outside of class, you're going to learn how to write essays, but there's no more take-home assignments, right? I expect to see that happening, um, you know, just like we saw in math class. I expect to see a lot more classes with testing, in-class testing, because that still works. Um, so I think we're going to see a mix of going back to the days of blue books for some classes and others embracing AI tools the way I have. And I think that's completely okay. That's interesting. I, I, I wonder, more generally speaking, um, what worries you as you think about advances in artificial intelligence? I mean, there's, of course, many people who are talking about, I mean, even in its most dramatic form, uh, once AGI is is uh, uh, accomplished, uh, artificial general intelligence, that, that there are some existential issues that may result from that in terms of competition between us and and, and the AGI. Um, but But, you know, as you contemplate the the realities and likelihoods of continued advancements, especially at the, the remarkable pace we're currently going at, what, what what worries you as you look to the, say, medium term? We have a major technological change happening, and these happen rarely, a generation or so, and it creates a lot of unpredictable effects. So one way I like to think about it is in scenarios, right? So I think a lot of people who are listening to this who haven't picked up, you know, haven't used AI a lot or have only used free chat GPT, which is very much not a great system to use, right? Um, those people uh, don't have any idea of, like they have a mental model that this is static, that AI has come out, it's kind of like blockchain, I'll get to it, like there's a lot of hype, it's obviously mostly garbage, I'm not going to worry about it right now, right? That They're wrong, this is advancing very quickly. On the other hand, we have the most advanced center, which is AGI, artificial general intelligence. That doesn't always mean a super intelligent machine that competes with us, but it might mean right now it's at the, you know, it's doing well in test scores, but, you know, what happens when it beats every human, every test score? And it's like a chess, you know, computer where, except for your job, whatever you could do, the AI will do better. That's the explicit goal of open AI and Anthropic and many of the AI companies to build that. And they think they can do it. So I think it's worth spending some time worrying about that. Less so as the competitor that, you know, species that will wipe us all out of the earth and more as like what happens when a, you know, a computer program can write a better book than you can. Right. What happens if we can do better consulting work that you can? I don't know if that's possible. Nobody does, but they're building towards that. The more likely scenario, or at least the most likely scenario in the near term, is either continued linear exponential growth. It's the eighth percent of BCG consultants this year. Next year's at the 82nd, 89th, 98th, 108th. I have no idea. And in that world, right, of then the future involves you focusing back to the human in the loop, focus on what you do best and the AI can be very liberating because it takes away the stuff you don't want to do for your job. And I think that's where I would be focusing in the near term. Mm. And what do you think about the the role the government should play in all of this? Uh, how much have you contemplated that and 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 uh, refl reflected on that? I mean, it needs to play both positive and negative roles. We obviously need to predict against the downside case. We need thinking about what happens if there's mass unemployment as a result of AI? I don't think that's likely, That's not, but we don't know. And even, by the way, if this is just changes in jobs, which is likely, Right, just like we had the jobs of accountants changed once spreadsheets came out. Right, accountants didn't lose their jobs; they switched to a higher end job instead of doing the math all day. 
But that those changes on mass, if you live through the Industrial Revolution, it's pretty disruptive. So there's likely to be some changes happening one way or another. And, and, and there's some downside risk using AI for you know malicious purposes. The, and the outside risk of AGI, all things the government should be thinking about. Mm -hmm. on the more, but on the sort of day-to-day -day level, we also need to think about where they're permitting stuff. There's a lot of regulated industries out there that are afraid to experiment with AI. How do we do that in a safe way that protects privacy and protects you know data security and respects patients? Big questions. But if the but if there's no regulation on it, then people aren't going to use it, or they'll just keep using it secretly. So I think there's a lot of open questions that they could help us address. You talked understandably about a lot of the entrepreneurial implications of this, and therefore small but 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 fast growing environments for larger scaled organizations, as uh, people here uh, represent in many cases. What, what do you think about the sort of broader adoption of you know co-pilots and other tool sets, and how would you suggest organizations think about? scaling those in their organization, uh, more broadly speaking? So co-pilots are both a really great way to introduce yourself to something and also a little bit of a um, of a secret saboteur inside your company. Um, so I'll explain both those things. As it was like, so let's first take the general principle that AI is, helps build, boost productivity in almost every job we measure, right? And But to do it, you need individuals using AI because it works best at the individual level, not the group level. So the thing I worry about talking to IT strategy people is that this is centralized in the IT department. There's a whole bunch of problems with that, right? One of those is that this doesn't work like IT technology. Coders are very bad at using this because it doesn't do what you're supposed to do. It doesn't always give you a well-formatted you know, formatted JSON file. Instead, it might insult you or, or tell you it never could do a JSON file or say it's unethical what you're doing. Like, that's not how software is supposed to work differently every time. And the second thing is that because AI has meant many things over the years to IT departments, the other concern I worry about is that they tend to think about this as sort of an amalgam of machine learning style AI, and they're, they're very concentrated on their own data matters a lot. And it's not actually clear that your own data helps you very much with a, with a GPT-4 plus class AI, because the P stands are pre-trained, already knows a lot of things. And as we talked about before, having all Bloomberg's data inside the Bloomberg GPT did not help it work better. So there's this kind of obsession left over from the big data training days of AI, which is we need to use our data. So the first solution everybody turns to is almost always a talk to our documents model. That's what every IT department builds. And that's a terrible model for AI because even if you have the perfect, just you know, a little technical rag-based system that's pulling back data in the right way, the AI still lies and hallucinates and makes stuff up. And that's not what anyone really wants from AI. When you figure out how people want AI is actually treating it like an HR problem or a training problem. How does everybody in the organization use AI? And then how do you get them to tell you what they've done to streamline their work? And how do you incentivize them to not be afraid to share that with you? And so I think it's really important to consider it that way. Now, co-pilots are a halfway step there. But they're, but the thing is, you're being kind of shielded from the core of the AI itself by the co-pilot. But the co-pilot does all of the disruptive stuff of AI without letting you do the advanced stuff. So I use Microsoft Word Copilot. I can write 50 pages uh, like in two minutes. Is that good or bad? Like many managers' jobs inside organizations producing words. That's their only job. And you judge by the quality of the words how, how smart they are. You judge by the quality of words how much effort they put in. You judge by the lack of errors of words about how much diligence they have, right? Their job might be ensuring the supply chain from Vietnam for monofilament or you know, you know, um, pigments, but to make up a term. But you know, what is that person doing who's in charge of that? They're writing a report every week about the state of the Vietnamese market. Um, and now they're just going to hit a button and create that. And they're going to send it to a boss who's going to hit a button and say, back, good job. What does that mean for organizations? And that's what I think I worry about the rollout without thinking what the meaning of this stuff is. Yeah. And yeah, likewise, actually, do you see, uh, there's also been a lot written about, you know, the the number of books and movies and video games and and, and art that is, that is being created will continue with greater levels of sophistication to be created. Do, do you have a sense for... Uh, the the competition that that yields. I mean, will will there, will there be a premium put on those versions of those things? The extent to which it can even be deciphered uh, that are created by humans versus those that will be created by by technology. Well, we're back to the question we asked before, which is how good, how fast. Right mm. now, AI is not a compelling writer compared to a human being. Right? I talk to Hollywood people. It's not like they're in the top 0.1 percent of ability to write a story. The AI is not close to that right now. Right. Uh, it's funny when you know going back to the AI sonnet. I actually had a on Twitter a, one of a world expert on sonnets, and I had the AI write a sonnet. And she's like, "This is looks like a good sonnet, but it's actually a bad sonnet because the whole idea of a sonnet is there's this emotional reversal in the final two lines of the sonnet that, so that put into context, and the AI doesn't do that well." Right. So like 
it right now it's producing art, you know, and sometimes it's great art by accident. Sometimes humans can got like it. So right now I think of AI like a synthesizer. When synthesizers first came out, it caused all this controversy because you couldn't play piano. Now you could do this, right? So it helps boost creativity as an individual. Will it get good enough that it makes a compelling movie and or video game? So I don't want to watch a movie created by humans. Maybe if we if it keeps, but like that's not the immediate threat, right? What you know, I I've t I know somebody at a game company who's as a single person is building a very high quality game because the AI is making the art and helping write the code and helping write the storyline. That's that's compelling. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Do, do you back to the large company setting, uh, the extent to which you continue to evaluate this? What are you seeing? You started to talk a bit about like use of co-pilots and the the value, or perhaps even in some cases, inflated value derived from that. Are there? Um, what are you? What are you seeing as some of some other um, aspects of the value that larger organizations are are deriving from from use of generative AI? So again, every early study we have finds performance boost, whether that is analytical tasks, writing tasks, persuasion tasks, ideation tasks, programming tasks, 20 to 80% performance improvements. Like that's very common to see. Also a huge leveling effect. Bottom performers get leveled up. These are compelling enough numbers that I think companies should be panicking, even if you don't worry about any other aspect of AI. If all your competitors are just getting 20 to 70% more employees and you're not thinking about that, that feels like a mistake. And I think a lot of companies are kind of waiting on this, like another technology. When you have that large a gain, if you do like an enterprise installation of Salesforce or whatever, right, you know it's going to be a four-year process. You're going to spend X million dollars to make it happen. You're going to pull off this many consultants and do this much off the line to hopefully gain, you know, whatever it is, 13% efficiency, right? We do a lot in IT for relatively small gains. There is a chance for very, very large gains from relatively small investment. And I think that's an incredibly compelling story. And I think the problem is, is that there's no instruction manual. There's no one to help you. You cannot hire a consulting company to do this because they don't know anything. I'm sorry, they just don't, right? Apologize to consultants in the room. I know this because I talk to OpenAI and Microsoft and Google on a regular basis, and nobody knows anything. They don't know what these systems could do. You know, OpenAI's got 12 people, you know, building, like, it's a slight over example, but like, they're not doing testing on the use case for a large scale accounting company. They're not doing a testing on the use case in a university classroom. They're, they don't know any of this stuff. The fact that the AI is as good as a doctor was a surprise. They never realized it would disrupt all of education. So you need to be doing rapid experimentation. The the biggest danger is centralizing authority in a committee of people, of seven people who will report back to the CEO of uses for AI. The CEO will set up an RFP request that will go be filled in four months from a series of consultants who, again, don't know anything, who will then come out and do an analysis for the following eight months to give you recommendations to build an internal-facing RAG system that talks to your documents. Don't do that, right? The power of AI is in the edges, the people using it for their job. You need to figure a way to incentivize them and capture that. You need to give them access to frontier models. And like, I know that's hard because that's not how IT departments work. But like the damage is going to happen one way or another. Your student, everyone's already using AI everywhere in your organization. They're just not telling you about it. So shadow IT spend is going to be your biggest concern, not actually internal security that way. People already, I can take a picture of a screen and the AI can read it. Like security doesn't mean what people think it means anymore. Yeah, great, great insights all around. Well, uh, Ethan Malik, thank you so much for a very compelling uh, conversation. Thank you also for your your great contribution through your new book, Co-Intelligence, Living and Working with AI. Uh, and, and and thank you for the, your, your many ruminations through oneusefulthing.org, something that I, I personally find very valuable to keep up to date on, on your thinking. Um, I really appreciate you spending time with me today. Thank you so much.